Ernest Krim, bro. Ernest, I appreciate you, man, so much for coming back to the platform. I want to congratulate you, give you all of your flowers, brother. Emmy nominated, and it doesn't matter about winning. You already won when it comes to us, bro. You give us great content every single day, great history. You're doing the work on social media and also in real life. So I just want to say I salute you. Appreciate that, bro. That means a lot. That's To me, that's what it's all about, man. As long as the community is receiving it, then I'm good. Yes, sir. For sure, man. For sure. As you know, November 6, 2024, very pivotal day in American history, but also Black American history. Ernest, from seeing on your page of, of you talking to our young Black brothers about having a purpose in life after this election, man, from just seeing so many things transpire about our people being so polarized, where you have Black men getting in spirited debates with black women or black men debating with other black men, black women debating with other black women. How do you feel after seeing the overall results and polls from this recent election, Ernest? You know, I, I feel like we have to always make sure that when we're dealing with uh, issues in this country, especially mm -hmm. when it's about black men and, and black women, we have to be clear on where those critiques initially originate from. Um, we're right. often made to to view each other as the problem as opposed to the system that we live under. And it seems to me as though as soon as it was announced that Kamala was running, that they were preparing this angle that it was going to somehow be our fault if she lost. Mm. You know, even though and I always want to remind people that it, as soon as she announced her campaign and this was y'all, this was a quick campaign. It was a few months ago. Black men from all across the country hopped on the call to raise millions of dollars for their sister before we even yeah. knew what her campaign was going to be about. And to me, I feel like that's reflective of how black men truly operate in spaces for our women. But I don't think that's yeah. often promoted. And I'm, I cannot speak to um, the very real feeling that some of our sisters have of not being supported because that does also exist. We are not monolithic, you know, and right. that's for every group. There's not a hundred percent of us who get behind people like we should, but I feel like the vast majority of us do. And I think the polls show that at the end of the election, because mm -hmm. they show that we voted for her at about yep. the same rate as we voted for Biden. And I think it yes. dropped the 1%, which it to me is reflective of the natural drop of Democratic support that would have occurred anyway. I believe right. truly that if Biden ran, that support would have been more, Ooh. it would have dropped yep. even more uh, exponentially, you know? Agreed. So, and I think there was somebody else who even made a post. Um, I believe it was uh, Isaac Hayes III who brought, who brought up the fact that there were millions of people who did not even go out and vote. So that's something to consider. And also, too, again, we got to focus on this this uh, social construct, this myth of, of white supremacy and mm -hmm. white women have been the top one of the top supporters for Trump. Uh, yes. White men, of course. I mean, that's they do right there based on the statistics. Latinos, Asians. When you look at these these stats, about 80 percent of black men, we're the most progressive group of men in this country. And we are very small demographic too. Let's let's also bring that up. We're talking, we 6% of the population. Of those of us who are voting, I've heard some people say 2%. So we're talking about a very, very small percentage. I know we are powerful, bro. We are amazing. Yeah. But y'all acting yeah. like based on that number that we can swing elections like that, right? So it is us, black men and black women who are the only reason there's a any hint of democracy in this country. That, like we are the reason look at how people are voting in terms of the voting rights act and the the uh you know uh the the, the, the social service programs that are in place the the services for immigrants who are able to come over mm -hmm. um i mean we are the foundation of that but we often also get blamed i want people to envision what that e what the democratic party even would look like without our Ooh. participation and and I know you ain't ask all this, but you know I, it's a lot on my mind. But like I I, yeah. I I really want us to to not feel the burden and onus to continue to carry um, a party over us. I feel you, brother. You feel what I'm saying? Yeah. Like yes, I, I, I am of the belief that yeah, I think in terms of policy, I think they by and large do more. Um, but I still think there can be a lot more done. So there's a void in that. 
But I think that we often prioritize the, the party, the people who represent the party, as opposed to building community and doing what's needed for us. So I, I, I hope that through this, that we are more in tune now with what needs to be done on the grassroots level, because we gave all of our energy to that, yeah. whether we voted or not, the energy yes. online, the conversation, the debates, yes. the anger, um, yes. we gave all of that to them. And now it, it's, it's gone. And, 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 and now we got to find a new idol. <laughs> right. Wow. And, 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 I, and I hope that idol becomes us and our community and doing what's needed, because just as much as they benefited from our support, and even though they lost, there are kids in our same neighborhoods right now that are begging for some type of love and support. And we've been ignoring them way too much. Come on now. I'm telling you, brother. Ernest, I feel just like you. I have so much on my mind. And that's why, man, I was thinking about us having this conversation weeks ago because I had a feeling I was telling all my friends and family, yes, Kamala, vote for her. Hope that she wins. But I knew in my heart of hearts that Trump, that he wasn't not only going to win, but that he was going to win by a landslide because our people have to understand this. White America was losing their grip. And this is a dream. This is propaganda of this is their land and is their land only. And seeing this, I'm not surprised. Honestly, brother, I'm not afraid. I expected this, but I think that so many black men will love this conversation because it's somewhat therapeutic because I think doing for self to your point is so vital. During this time, man, we can't sulk. We can't get scared. We can't get sad. This is honestly, to me, a blessing in disguise because it, it forces Black America to not be comfortable right now. But, Ernest, what do you think that the overall DNC failed at when it came to winning? Because Black people voted. I saw 92% of Black women voting for Kamala. I think 80% uh, 80 of Black men. But I saw white women voting for Donald Trump. Can you just highlight, like, what do you think that when it comes to the DNC, Democratic Party, what did they do wrong with this election, in your own opinion? Yeah, I mean, I um, I think it is more so, I don't even think it's just this election. I just think what they do wrong in general. Um, right. I, I don't think they are, I don't think they do well with messaging. Um, you know, because I, I hate to even put myself out there and because I don't, I don't really like the way we have our structure set up with these parties, but Right. I think that if you look statistically and you look at the legislation and like those who have been so-called liberal minded, whether they used to be Republicans back in the day of Lincoln or the Democrats more recently in our lifetime, they mm -hmm. have passed things that have helped us, helped us more than any, you know, the other party, the other major party Republicans. But like people don't know like what they have done that has helped us because the messaging isn't well. And what I mean by messaging is people voted for Trump, not because he's actually going to do anything. We know, like, again, statistically, the economy is, has been better under Democrats based on statistics. But Republicans advertise themselves as a party that's about money and helping people get wealth and things like that. When that's just not the case. It's for certain people. But they don't lean into that. They spend a lot of time chasing him and telling us how they're not like him but if your identity is resting and is based upon not being like somebody then you can only exist as long as that thing exists so once trump is gone because he can only do two terms then who will you be he's 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 he got some mentees man the jd vance selection was strategic yeah. this brother yes. about probably about he's a little bit older than me like that's wild to me because I said of how that too, he carries Ernest. himself man. he's next he next. So he yes. I think he might be 40, early 40s. Right. Yeah. Now, if Trump is 80, imagine Trump getting started at this at 40. And then yeah. Trump, they put an in more, not just the Supreme Court justices, because they probably gonna have two that retire. But then all the hundreds of federal judges, y'all just mm. like to be real, we cooked in terms of the, the political political aspect of things. That's like so the DNC probably should have been listening more to black people probably should have been listening more to black men and what they've been saying. Probably should have been listening more to advocates uh, for Palestinian liberation. Probably mm -hmm. should have been listening more to the progressives and things like that. Um, if like, again, Trump made people feel like he did something because he didn't want to give checks, but when he eventually did, he put that stamp on it. Um, he, he benefits y'all because 
he like it's probably gonna sound crazy but he keeps it real even though he lies it's hard to explain like he yeah, he, <laughs> he i feel he, you you know what i'm saying like and, yeah. and bro most a lot of folks in this country this is not just our this is a lot this is the american culture people ain't making choices based on what's best for them bro we not we not saying you know what based on this data i'm gonna choose this no we going i got a feeling that's a vibe right there. It's like, no, that's mm. going to kill you, but I, it feels good. And mm. we addicted to that, bro. We have a hyper individualistic society and, and, and people want to know where am I going to get my next check and listening to somebody who is a billionaire, probably mainly off donations at this point, but it's a billionaire sounds better than listening to um, a black woman who we perceive to be out of touch with our culture or and that's within our community. But then there, there's also the, the, the segment of the population that would never want to listen to a black woman. We got folks, bro. I know black women who catch hell but when they become a boss, a manager over some white folks, especially white women. So I was thinking the same thing you thought. I'm like, man, Hillary Clinton couldn't even convince white women to vote for her. So we think we made, a, well, not we, we think they made enough moral progress to say, mm. well, I'll let this black woman preside over me. Ain't no way in hell they was going for that, man. So the DNC, I think they had to realize they got whooped. And I don't think that's a Kamala thing. I think that's a cultural thing for them. Yeah. They've done harm, but they've done better things than Republicans have done. I mean, for instance, I don't think I would have to, I, I wouldn't be as concerned about social services leaving with Kamala. I wouldn't be as concerned with education not being funded with Kamala. But with that said, there's more they can do. So they have to lean into what they've done, I would say. And then also listening to your critics. These people, we ain't hating on y'all. I don't envy. I don't want to be one of y'all. <laughs> I, I don't want to be a politician. I don't want to be a Democrat. I want what's best for my people and my allegiance is to us. And, and if the party is going to show what they're doing, what they're promoting, then I'm going to lean into that for us. But then the moment y'all get out, out off that, then we still, you know, like, and I think that's something they take for granted too. I think that it is, it's, there's a perception that we have this unrelenting loyalty to a party. And when that's not the case, man, and, and there are a lot of, even a lot of cities where even though our numbers have stayed the same, we're seeing a, a, a shift in terms of, like, well, if y'all not going to proclaim y'all going to do something for us or at least tell us what you did, then I'm going to explore other options. So all in all, bro, they got to get their marketing down. Mm -hmm. You know, like, again, he he benefits from the marketing. Um, and also, too, be very clear about what you've done. And also, too, I think, listen to the detractors, all those hundreds of thousands of millions of people who voted for the Green Party or did not vote or decided to sit at home. Even though it could harm them, they didn't make that choice because y'all were the best. They made that choice because they don't feel like you're doing anything for them. Mm, you know, on, yeah, I'm just saying, bro. Like, I, I, I yeah. sometimes, like, sometimes you need to take a second look at those hateful comments, not the ones that's pure malice, but the ones where it's like, you know what, that might have a point. I might have to change a little bit of how I. There's some truth in it, man. So I, I, I don't. I want them to do better, not because I care about them. I want them to do better because at this point, we don't have a large enough of another, like another party that's large enough to wield resources to help us. Um, right. And I'm saying that from the perspective of those who are most vulnerable. You know what I'm saying? Because for a lot of folks who are, you know, might have the resources, they, they might not impact us as much. But we have a lot of our people, y'all, that are living in low-income environments that need healthcare access, that need what the schools are providing. And this is truly going to hurt them. So we got to make sure they straight before we talk about what, you know, we don't want to do, what we don't want from a party. Come on, brother. And to that, to everything that you just said, and by the way, bro, that whole take, I agree with that a thousand percent. I think about Brother Malcolm, right behind you, right behind me. And I feel like the chickens have come home to roost because we've been taken advantage of. They've assumed and unfortunately made an ass out of themselves of thinking we got this in the bag. And I think to that standpoint about marketing, right? I think about here in Atlanta of seeing Meg Thee Stallion on stage twerking. I think about a Glorilla. I think about a Cardi B, a Usher even. 
and Malcolm even he spoke about this. It was an insult to our intelligence as a people of thinking that they would sway and make us feel some type, even a Beyonce of okay, because Beyonce said it, or because Meg is twerking and talking about reproductive rights while twerking. I'm just like, we are hypersexualizing black women while talking about reproductive rights. This is white supremacy at its finest because it's presented in this very digestible manner where it looks safe. And I think that nail in the coffin for me, Ernest, was the man from your beloved Chicago, Barack Obama, talking down to black men. And I'm going to be real. When I saw that, I was like, yeah, they're cooked because he's panicking. Why else would you be talking to black men like that? And why is it always talking down to us when 80 percent of us still voted for Kamala? From you being and living and being from Chicago, Ernest, how did you feel of seeing President Obama talking down to black Man, men? Yeah, that's um, bro. That that's, you made. I, I forgot about the whole thing with celebrities too. Um, even before I get to the Obama thing, I think that so. Man, you know, as a former classroom educator, um, it's very important. They always stress this, but I realize the more you know, the more I talk. But you have to build bonds with students before you can actually get them to do something so like if you have kids who are apathetic throughout te throughout school they don't care about their work um just you giving them a great lesson plan ain't gonna matter you have mm -hmm. to have that connection like they they know they they feel that you're real with them they feel that you ain't just there you know i've had vulnerable moments with my students when something can happen in my personal life i keep it real with them when something happens in the community i stop class we talk about it they've seen me at my best and my worst so when when they might be doing something in class they not supposed to be doing sometimes i just give them the look or sometimes i can let them know and because we have that connection like that and that realness that's established, they like, I'll do it for you, Mr. Krim, but, but nobody else. You know, that is lacking with Democrats. They like, you can't just start trying to, you got to start campaigning now, <laughs> the day after you lost. <laughs> you need to be telling everybody thanks for support. Like, I, I don't know if this is like really hard for people to understand. I ain't even working sales or nothing, but like, I you know, thank my customer. Thank you for, right. thank you anyway. Thank you for what you did. And we need to do a better job of listening. Um, you know, you can't wait until you got a black candidate to try to appeal to black people. He's like, you like, it has to, and, and in, a, in a lot of ways, Obama may have symbolically, I ain't even talking about policy, but symbolically may have done damage for any other black person that runs moving forward because we saw what that felt like i was looking at some old footage from when i was in college and he won bro we were so excited man but at the same time i think they because he whooped mccain right he whooped romney i think the belief is that oh okay well biden it's not working out okay throw, throw him the identity politics throw him the black woman you know throw him a black person and a woman nobody can say no to that right right you forget that in the whole DEI thing, it's diversity, but then it's equity, then it's inclusion. Mm. So we talk about the symbol, the person, but then the person must allocate the resources. We missing that whole aspect of this whole thing. So we don't like, and, and then you insult our intelligence again, like with the celebrities coming out, with get, with with uh thinking that we just gonna run to the polls, even though again, she was the best candidate out of those two parties. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of folks who would feel so insulted to the point where they won't vote because they think that you're giving her to us because we ain't even going to think critically. If we just voted because somebody was black, then it wouldn't have took Obama all, you know, like the 2008 to be, a, <laughs> to be a, like hey, Clarence Thomas, he would have been president, man. Bro, if we, we going off identity. Bro, we didn't we didn't rock with Tim Scott. We didn't rock yep. with Herman Cain. Like <laughs> Herman Cain. We didn't rock I with about Herman. Yeah. Bro, we didn't rock with Condoleezza Rice. Yeah, <laughs> like it's an insult. <laughs> so like you, again, they should be campaigning now. They lost to Congress. They lost to Senate. We ain't gonna have a Supreme Court. Jesus. Shout out to the local folks in my community, man, because we got some some black women who are progressive elected in terms of like the county nice. board, um, and and judges as judges as well. But on the federal level, y'all cooked, man. And in terms of what Obama did, I I, I feel, you know, um, for one, again, I, I felt like it was really bogus for a lot of us to jump to the conclusion 
of knowing how we would vote based on polls when Hillary thought she was going to win based on polls and lost to Trump in 2016. We can't draw a conclusion based on how black men or black anybody going to do or any race going to do until the actual results come out. And who are people even polling? We don't know who y'all talking to. Nobody hits me up. You know what I'm saying? So the snippet I saw, it took me back because I was like, man, I, I don't, that's as a, as a person who makes a living off communicating with people who's had to talk to parents and understanding that whenever you want to deliver something to a parent about their child, you start with good news first. I'm, if I, if I'm like, it's already hard, bro, as an educator when I was in a class to make time to talk to any parent. Cause I got a million things to do first, but when something really bad happens, I got to, but then I feel bad. Cause I'm like, Ah, oh, they gonna just, I mean, I hate that feeling. You, you gonna hit me up with my kid doing bad? What about? So I gotta start off with, and I have the mindset that no no child is bad. So I love how um, you know, James participates in his energy in class, and you know how he's a leader and volunteers and blah blah blah. But I have to let you know that. You know, uh, the other day, James did something that wasn't that flattering. It didn't really represent who he is as a person. Right. Obama is one of the greatest orators in American history, right? In terms of when I bro speak, I feel good. And I, again, I ain't talking about the policy. I feel, I'll be like, dang, that man make me really feel like, man, <laughs> I want to go out and do something. But when we saw him in that situation, I don't know who mm. was recording. They probably shouldn't have been recording and posting it. But he wasn't on the stage performing then. He it, it looked as like as again, like you blaming six percent, you blaming us for what we don't even know is gonna happen yet, and you're blaming us without even knowing how we truly gonna vote. Wow. Again, I do look at it from the perspective of it was just a snippet, but I felt like the tone was a tad bit demeaning. Um, and I and I think that if you truly want to encourage people to again to do something, you have to start with the standpoint of look, black man. Y'all the most progressive block of men in this country. I I am concerned though, because I'm wondering, is it true that a lot of y'all, a lot of po folks in our community are thinking about not supporting Kamala? If that's true, let me know how you feel. Bro, that, mm, I could I could have wrote like that. that. I could have wrote that for Obama. And I ain't I like never been that. president, bro. Yeah, I like that. You, you see yeah. how that made you feel, right? Yeah. Be because, like, again, we not act like we, we all know some brothers like who. Mm -hmm really be on some bogus stuff, right? In terms of how they talk about women, how to, and you yep. be trying to like talk like, man, why why you why you feel that way? That's real messed up, dude. Like, I'm not going to convince him to change by demonizing him or labeling him as something. My thing is, I want to gain a better understanding. And let's be real, Obama, um, you out of touch. And that's just real. For anybody who ascends to that level, you out of touch. You ain't been normal since 2007, probably, when you announced she was running. Because at that point, everybody treats you differently based on what they perceive you to be and give. You have a, achieved like an icon status in this country. For as long as this country exists, you will be viewed as the one who broke the mold and all that type of stuff. And, if, and that's a gift and a curse. Because when have you when have you able to truly been able to go to a, a barbershop, right? Because they love a barbershop. But when have you ever been able to go play pickleball, right? You haven't been able to do that because everybody who sees you has to uh, 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 capitulate to you and act a certain way. So you got to find a different way, bro, to really get in tune with what um what we feeling. And, and you know what I'm saying? And so I, I think that's the main thing. And, and, I, and I say all that to say, I got a profound amount of respect again for what he was able to achieve through this system. The whole again the policy debate and and is a whole nother thing because he he was also the person that awoke uh, that made me realize that this system is a setup um, and, and and that this empire is something that none of us can reform through political office. But in terms of a, a symbolic thing, he did something great. But if he wants to continue to be in in touch with with us, because again, as as people who were enslaved on this land. We have a completely different experience than he has had throughout his life culturally. He got to truly find a better way to get in tune with us. Uh, and again, it can't come when the candidate is running. Um, it has to come throughout through a different medium and method. For sure, brother. Ernest, so a question for you. Do you think that President Obama getting elected in 2008 was actually a bad thing for us? Because after that, right, we see hate crimes going up. We start seeing the Trayvon Martins of the world, the 
um, Alton Sterling's and so many more, right? And then you get a Trump who is white people's Obama, right? Where now <laughs> white people feel like we got to fix this. We got to make sure that we never mess up like this again. And it's like they aren't letting up. So do you think that Obama winning in 2008 where us as a people felt like it was prophetic? It was amazing. I remember seeing Obama T-shirts everywhere. People trying to find Barack, his name in the Bible and saying it's prophecy and black people were going crazy. But ultimately, do you think that that kind of hurt us in the long run by having a black man mm. sitting in the Oval Office? Man, um, hmm, I think that I can't say that it hurt us. I think our expectations hurt us. Mm. Uh, you know, I I think that um, because what I mean is, again, I, there will never through this country's paradigm and structure. The way things are now, you can't like this was created for white folks, the way they got things set up here. Right. So when you have somebody who goes through the system to try to create and let's say he went from the perspective of I want to go through the system to do something for everybody that would be impossible to a point because you would technically have to redo the whole thing because you would right. get stopped at when you get to a certain level of trying to do things for people. I don't think that we truly understood that. And I have to think, speak from where I was too politically because being in college at the time and I was studying black history. So that was like, I couldn't believe what I was witnessing right now, bro. <laughs> I was looking at again, the videos and pictures I had from that time. I had the Obama shirt. Like you said, I got footage, <laughs> me and my friends was, we were celebrating. We went down to the main part of the campus and I'm at a PWI, everybody mm. celebrating, everybody happy, all different backgrounds. And I think the idea was we did it and he's going to do it for us, but that's just not how it works. No. <laughs> it's just not how it works. No. <laughs> it's not how it works. Because truthfully, if he was going to do for us, he would not have been in office for eight years. Ooh. It's just not going to wow. happen. That's just like, it, it's it's not going to happen in this country. And if you do for us to the furthest extent, you will be removed. Like, you know what I'm saying? So like, it, it it's, 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 it's like this, bro. When you, Jackie Robinson, when you become that first, right? You have to make a conscious decision to say, am I going to come in here with a, a no holds barred, um, scorch earth approach and do what I can in the time that I'm here and just dip? Or am I going to hold my tongue um, in every form and fashion that I can with the hopes that this paves the way for other people? And I think he probably went in there with that approach thinking that that was, was going to help. But I think we underestimate um, how whiteness works in this country. You know, again, it's it's a it's a huge percentage of them. There are also those who are who will fall under the Hispanic uh, ethnicity who would prefer to be aligned with that with that uh, that type of whiteness, who are willing to work against us. I mean, the Spanish had I think twelve different categorizations for Come for race. Now. So it, it, this isn't new. Right. And again, yeah. when we're talking about even their uh, group ethnicity, that's the an ethnicity and it's not a race. So I think that our expectations were very high, man. And even going back to the baseball analogy, you know, Moses Fleetwood Walker was actually the first black person to integrate baseball. But Moses Fleetwood Walker came in and, and he wasn't playing. Moses Fleetwood Walker was not playing. He wasn't about these games, late 1800s. He was very politically radical in his approach. But also, two white folks got so upset with Moses Fleetwood Walker that they had a gentleman's agreement then to reban black people. And I don't think that Obama was radical to that point like that, but I think he was viewed like Moses Walker. So now the gentleman's agreement is we can never, we never let them get any type. No, like we ain't letting you. You see what happened to us? They think their whole world was caving in. But by and large, based on the numbers, what he did benefited white folks more than any other group, man. Mm. He was doing things that was helping white people. They 67 percent of the population. So I think that we um to, to kind of land my plane, bro. I think that we just have to be real of what we expect from politicians and what they can do. My perspective now on Obama is completely different. I still wish he would have done more. For us, um, I, I think that we were all that, but also I know the limitations of the system. I know how many people was trying to stop them. 
And I also understand that I can never expect a politician to do more than I expect from of myself and my immediate community. And we have been uh, drunk, I think, bro, and intoxicated with the image of a Lincoln, the image of even a king, the image of Obama, um, our saviors in politics outside of King, because he wasn't a politician. But we we keep because con- we're fed this through the individualistic scope of America. We are communal people, but we're fed individualism. So we keep thinking, well, we got to have that person. That could, we got to, oh, maybe Kamala, or maybe it's Obama, or maybe it's going to be him, or maybe it's, no, it's not. It's, it's not. It's going to be us, bro, because the collective yeah. that came together is what elected Obama, and that's that same collective that got on that call for Kamala, and it's that same collective that can come together now, and not for a politician, but for us. And the mm. question is, will we do that without being um, provoked to do so? Man. Right. This conversation is much needed. It's heavy. I'm enjoying this, Ernest. Now it's about to get even deeper because, bro, you had mentioned something that a lot of people would have missed culturally of our people being enslaved in this land. And I find something eerily similar between Barack Obama and Kamala. And yeah. anytime that we as Black people who have a four, fifth, six plus generations on this land bring this up, is that when these people who are presented to us to represent us, we notice that they don't have a lineage tied to this land. And I don't think that that's by coincidence at all. Um, And when we are brought a Barack Obama, a Kamala Harris, they're black, technically, yes, but they don't have this same experience as us. Ernest, do you find it eerily Mm -hmm. and sometimes odd that the people who are brought to us don't have a big mama that's from Mississippi or from (laughs) Georgia who has stories about lynchings and has stories about sharecropping. Because me personally, I feel like that connection can't be the same. Yes, we all experience white supremacy on a global level, but it's something something that is very different, very specific to that Black American experience. Why is it when these presidential or these Black presidential candidates are brought to us? For some weird reason, they don't have that Black American deep-rooted experience. Oh, Why man, is it I like de- that, Ernest? Bro, I definitely noticed that. I, I thought it would have it, it would have been ex- very interesting, man, to have two Black presidents in our country and to have neither one of them having that that connection to right. our land that way and our our cultural experience. Um, I think from a and I, I'll, I'll make it like a pop culture analogy where you have heard um, actors in Hollywood talk about being overlooked, you know, maybe by British actors or, or other foreign black actors. And there's always this, this wonder of like, how, why aren't y'all trying to, why aren't we getting the same opportunities that they get? What's going on with us? And people would speak about the fact that they felt that having that person who is separate from our unique cultural experience would make them easier. And I want people to really catch this easier to work with when doing certain movie roles and being easy to work with. That's not necessarily a compliment to the person, you know, being easy to work with. It depends on what you're trying to do. Being easy to work with means that you could potentially, because you don't have that same cultural lineage or linkage, means that you might be look over some things or certain inaccuracies or certain uh, um, omissions from telling the story. You know, you think about the critiques that, um, I think her name was Cynthia, who played Harriet Tubman. Um, Cynthia Revo. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, <laughs> and Samuel Jackson, he didn't like that. <laughs> bro, I, and when, yeah. I, I, when I watched the movie again, some years later, I watched it with my oldest daughter, and I, I was like, nah. It's the accent for me, bro. Killing bro, me. What, Bro, that yeah. wasn't it. And yeah. and I was glad my because my daughter loves Harriet. I was glad she had a yeah. visual for what that could have looked yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. But it, the energy, we again, we can feel it. We can mm-hmm. feel it, right? We ain't talking about the energy people get from Trump. That's something different. We talking right. about that energy. We talking about like, bro, when I I re, I'm, I'm of course I live in the Chicago area. I remember taking road trips to the South Man and my first time like being going through Alabama. And mm-hmm. um I one time driving was actually headed to Florida and I saw a plantation um, that yep, looked that's like where you see it when you go to bro, Florida. Yep. Yep. I know I exactly saw, what you're talking about. If you remember that scene from Django one chain, <laughs> when they was in the front picking cotton, that mm-hmm. plantation reminded me that bro, I felt something. 
You know what I'm saying? Like I I felt, and I'm driving feeling this. When we we took a road trip to Myrtle Beach and on the way back, because my family on my dad's side was was of course forcibly enslaved through South Carolina, and I was trying to find a plantation in that area, um, as best I could that was adjacent to that county, and I went to one, and bruh, like, the and it just so happened it was a rainy day, it didn't have an internet connection, I, so I had to really be in tune with everything, bro. You feel it, man. I, I can't imagine living that close to a point. I probably be enraged all the time. So if you're going to have me, if I'm going to play somebody who was enslaved, I'm not just, I'm not just tapping in from a visual perspective because I'm black and they black. I'm tapping in with my ancestors because literally the people who had to persevere and survive, that is in me. I can't be here without them. So it's not just a movie role to me. I'm not just playing Harriet. I am Harriet, bro. Like, Okay, another example. When Denzel played Malcolm X, they, Ooh. bruh, you, you, you see, I ain't got to say nothing. You, bruh, favorite movie of all time. <laughs> all Ernest. time, bruh. As a child, watching it on repeat. All time. And why? Because, for one, Spike Lee yeah. and Denzel. And Denzel mm -hmm. played it. He lived that role of Malcolm X mm -hmm. and Angela Bassett, Angela bruh. Bassett, yes, Come sir. Come on, man. Because he, I, he, he, Denzel lived it. He felt it. That's why we connect so much with Brother Malcolm because we know that feeling. We know what he's talking about. So going back to the political standpoint, I believe because if I if I lived in let's say in Nigeria or something, I'm black, but I think it would be easier for me to then overlook their experiences historically. Yeah, we connect, right? But I might be able to say, well, it's not that big of a priority for me to uh, make sure I'm prioritizing what you need. I, I, again, I, I think they both entered that space with good intentions. I think if you look at how they all, they both came up, they came up doing some type of political stuff or service, but I think that it's easier for the machine to get behind that person. Because then on the other end, you you if you see a black person descent or go to that level, then they usually have made a conscious effort to disavow themselves with anything black. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so my, my thought is, dang, how long would it take for a black American who has enslaved to get to that level? And then my follow-up question is, would I even want them to? I, I mean, bro, and, and again, the, the cultural thing, just like you said, I think for people who were saying she wasn't black, which I didn't like that talk. I think we should have been more specific though. I think we were trying to say she ain't the black I know, or like, I, I think that's what some people meant because we didn't really know who her, we know her father's the black Jamaican, but we didn't really know his, her father. We didn't see him. You know what I'm saying? We didn't, we didn't, we didn't know like about the grant again, like you said, the big mama, we like the, the stories of that experience kind of often came starting from Howard, you know what I'm saying? But like, if if you or I was in that position, that story of black could could start with we we grew up and we was you know going to the corner store or we was hooping all day or we was doing this and you know what I'm saying we had to avoid this and the dudes on our block was you know so I I think that cultural aspect was definitely uh missing but I I, I think we I so I'm really trying to reflect on this man because I think we have to be careful um for any black person that's in politics, especially that's close to that level, you got to really be clear on if you really even want that. You know what I'm saying, bro? Because right. there, I'm I'm really, you know how we, you know, and I, and I do this a lot. So like the first black, you know, we talk about like the first black person right. to do this. And, and, and oftentimes I think that we have to sometimes take a step back because it considers, it, it, it's also contingent upon the, the framework of that firstness how the firstness was used or what it's for um to be the first black police officer I, mean, I don't know if that's you know what i'm saying like i don't unless you found a way to to really break down that system right to be the to be the first black like to be the first black person with enslaved ancestry over the empire might not really be the achievement we think it is if you don't go in there with clear intentions and if you go in there with those clear intentions to truly help those, cause it would help us, but it would also help everybody else. Then there would no longer be an empire. And this structure exists and is predicated upon 
being able to be an empire and strip people away and conduct and promote genocide and so on and so forth. So um, do we want that is the question, man. I've dabbled with politics. I, I did a, a small run, like write in campaign for city council. And I, I didn't need, I didn't like the way I was feeling when I was running, bro. Wow. I didn't like I didn't like that I had to find a way to make my answers inclusive of everybody. <laughs> Be real <laughs> with you. And that's no wow. disrespect because I, of course I love everybody, but my my main focus is us and anybody else that's with that can of course join. I'm up for all of humanity, but by being for us, that includes y'all. You go you go get your stuff yeah. too, just because when you again they, there's a group study, I'm sorry, Citibank study that says that um if America solves racism, we're adding trillions of dollars to the GDP. But if you want to play the game of politics, you have to make a conscious effort to ignore the very community you came from. And then what that cost, and what that, I'm sorry, and at what cost <laughs> would that come? Ernest, brother, you are cooking because every sentiment that you just expressed is exactly how I've been feeling throughout the past six plus months. The the overall DNC, the Democratic Party as a whole literally just showed us that they would rather lose than have a tangible black agenda. They just showed us that. And speaking on that point, right, we will have people in positions of power with a black face, but a white supremacist mindset. And I think that our people have to get way more meaner, way more demanding because playing back clips and I know that we'll have some Kamala supporters, which is perfectly fine, engage into the conversation. But I've played the full interviews where she said that she's not going to do anything solely for black people. That statement is not out of context. I mm -hmm. played that entire interview. Mm -hmm. I've seen her entire interview and clips of her literally expressing that America is not a racist country. And that goes to your point of having to compromise. Man, why do you think our people sometimes don't get pissed off enough? Because if this was the white community, this was... Other communities that I cannot say, <laughs> they will <laughs> they will shut that down, Ernest, that day. And they know not to even talk to them that way. We've heard leaked phone calls with President Joe Biden talking to Al Sharpton. The Black Caucus telling them that y'all need to play nicer and play better with Hispanics, that eventually they will replace you guys, potentially. Joe Biden telling us that we aren't Black if we don't vote for him. And we're still voting for these people. Blindly, what will it take, Ernest, for our people to realize Yo, we have to draw a line in the sand because, brother, I'm tired of it. I'm tired yeah. of seeing our people getting talked down to. I'm tired of yeah. our people not being put on any type of black agenda. And yeah. one last thing as well, I'm tired of seeing us being put on the back burner. I saw Donald Trump show up to the NABJ conference and Kamala Harris show up later. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, said a thousand words because I'm like, yeah. black journalists aren't a priority to you. But mm -hmm. I'm off my rent. But what will it take, Ernest, for our people to finally say, yo, these people are wilding out. They will crash out. They will crash out willingly yeah. before giving us a black agenda. Man, um, wow. Yeah, yeah. I feel that, brother. I feel that. I I think that I it's almost like I'm not I'm not sure about your your work background, but like mm -hmm. if you've ever had a job where you feel like you've had to compromise who you were for eight hours for sure. <laughs> just to make yeah. a living. Um, I feel like I don't even, that's what politics is like in this country um, in a lot of ways. And it's really, it's almost like the, the higher the level you go to. So like, if you like school board, maybe not as much, right? City council, maybe not as much. Anything that's in your immediate community, you probably could do a lot more, especially when they don't even have a political party attached to it in city politics in most places. But once you start you're talking about state, you go into the state government, okay, got to refine that image a little bit, right? And then you talk about going to the federal level, right? When they mean by refine that image is we got to make you palatable to white people. And I, I think that a lot of politicians, not every single one of them, of course, but a lot of our politicians who look like us go into this saying, well, if I sacrifice just a little bit, I can get there. And then when I get there, I'll do what I can for us. But survey says that don't happen. That don't happen because as you do that, you, you, you really stripping apart from your soul each time you do that. And I think the lesson that lesson for me began with Obama again um, with um, 
uh, Reverend Jeremiah Wright, who was someone who was, you know, very close Not to my family. That, Man, yeah, bro, like wow. Jeremiah Wright, like, again, it's, I, always, I always tell people it's personal for me because, for one, he's done so much for the South Side community. He ain't from Chicago, you know. He's done so much for us out here. He mentored my pastor growing up, so that I grew up in a very Afrocentric Christian environment. Um, who that and that same pastor mentored my mom, Reverend Jeremiah mentored my father. I talked to my father about it one day. He told me Jeremiah Wright literally saved my life by providing me guidance. And 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 without Jeremiah Wright, there is no political career for Obama because for him being able to get ingrained with that South Side community at Trinity, and that's the South South Side man, that helped him refine his image. So I saw that when he was going to that level. They unearthed that clip, which was 100% fact, and he had to disassociate himself. And that's when I began to have the understanding, oh, that might not be something I really even want. Because if I, if somebody pull up a clip of my childhood pastor growing up, and you tell me, <laughs> even if it's a snippet, maybe I'll, oh, he could have, I'm not disassociating myself. That's family right there. I can't, so I, I think people who say they want that have to understand that's what you going to do. <laughs> okay. Like when they ask you about racism, you're going to say America's not a race. That don't even make sense, bro. We are on the, not even talking about our experience, bro. This country was built on the, on the backs of, of native American people. Some of us of which who are have indigenous ancestry, we we're built on the foundation of their bone, their bones, their corpses, bro. Like straight slaughter. But we don't have, you know what I'm saying? And then you mm -hmm. talk about what continues to happen to us. But that's also what America is also based on. It's denying that. And if you are a black politician that can tap in to that deniability while also having a non-white disposition, then you'll it'll probably be easier for you to be accepted because they say, oh, well, that person is probably not going to do what they can. Um, and, and I think that for us, again, the same concept is, well, we think, as long as we get in a little bit, it'll make things better. I think we have an overall concept and understanding that our success is based upon how we fit into the system as opposed to actively working on a large scale in mass to create something um, that exists, not solely within it, but within the same parameters of it. Like this country exists on this land mass and this system we created does too. And it's, I think it's hard for us to conceptualize, bro, because a lot of us, um, myself included, because I'm still learning, we don't really have a comprehensive understanding of who we were before this. So if I if I can't if I can't visualize what I was before this trauma and this country that was built on my back by force, then I can't really imagine what I can make that's better. When the things that we had prior to this are far better than anything that was created by the descendants of enslavers. It's just yeah, like, bro. I mean, like, bro, like we we are so amazed by the, and I get it, man, the iPhone and all this stuff is cool, bro. But we can see that morally, this this place, people here ain't making no progress. We mm. we keep measuring progress by gadgets and technology. That's the problem. That's so, insane. Bro, we 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 got we got to continue to unlearn the inner workings of the white supremacist ideology and realize how much, again, the very fact that we celebrate Dr. King, but can't probably name five people in his inner circle. That's a white supremacist ideology of, 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 of uplifting the individual as opposed to the community. I, I had to really figure this out, man, because I would do a lot. I would, whenever I would see a, a, the first white person to do something, I'll be like, of course, what we do, right? I know we did it before mm -hmm. them, but you find that very often you're not going to be able to name an African person because we didn't always name the people who did the thing because it was a community thing. We didn't feel honor in that like because it wasn't just us. The same thing about Native Americans. You ain't going to find in history indigenous people, real estate owners. We don't own the <laughs> land, right? We, yeah. Like the, the, the number one real estate developed. Oh, bro, we don't own this land. We're borrowing this land from the divine. Mm -hmm. So we got to strip it away, strip it away. And in and, and all honesty, man, like I, I, I just I, I feel like we have to use this as an awakening. Um, and like you said, it could bless it in the skies and go back to, to, to the ground level and say, what are we doing here? Where are we going? <laughs> How are we going to get there? And what role does any politician play? 
because they can't do it all. They won't do it all. And I don't want them to. I mean, I got a lot of critiques, especially for Obama. You know what I'm saying? Like, but I, bro, I, but for real, I love Obama. I love Kamala and what they've done and what they've done for us in my awakening, because I think more than any other uh, individuals in our country's history, they will help us realize that they were not ever in a position to be or even trying to be the people we think they were in terms of a, I think we thought they was going to be Harriet or Rosa. Yeah. That's not the same. That's not the same, bro. LBJ only did it because of King. We want Kings. LBJ is whoever. Any any white dude could be LBJ. You just got to feel this pressure. We need the Harriets, the Roses, the Denmark Beast. You know what I'm saying? Like we 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 need people like that that we mold our kids to be. But as long as we keep thinking from a white supremacist framework, we ain't gonna believe a person could be that unless they have a certain suit and tie, a certain job description, a certain test score, a certain salary, bro. Those folks are right here in our community. They down the street at your school. They hanging on the corner. Matter of fact, those are the folks that probably got more potential than us. <laughs> they the ones who are probably most revolutionary because they like, I ain't yep. doing nothing with this system, bro. <laughs> nothing, man. <laughs> oh, man, Ernest, bro, this conversation so therapeutic for me, brother, because of just talking to you is a breath of fresh air because either some people are too far over here or too far over there. So hearing this, man, is music to my ears. And I think about another icon in Chicago. Y'all have so many icons. Minister Louis Farrakhan, who had met with President Obama, and he protected him by not even making that picture public until he was out of office. And I'm like, President Obama, he's not going to publicly tell you that he met with Farrakhan in mm -hmm. Chicago. But to your point, Jeremiah Wright, all the great works that he's been doing, man. And it might have been uh, Dr. John Henry Clark or Asa Hilliard, I think. But if they had once stated, if we judge everything, Post 1619, everything looks like progress. Yep. yep and that's yep, a Dr. big Clark. mistake for us. Yep, yep. That's a big mistake for us because to your point, we're, we're always thinking of we've made so much progress. President Obama on the pivot told them we made so much progress. But I'm like, what's the starting point? What's the benchmark? That's the question yeah. that people aren't asking. Ernest, what do you think it would take for reparations to be a topic of discussion, not for the Green Party, which they were talking about, of course, but on a mass major scale when it comes to the DNC, RNC of, yeah. okay, reparations, especially from the DNC, because I think in, what is it, it's 2024, it'll be what, 2028? Do you think that reparations will be a major topic of discussion and not just reproductive rights when it comes towards right. trying to get that black vote? Yeah, man, I, I think we had a point in time where that um, conversation, I feel like on a national scale has gotten further than it's ever been. I think it's right. important for us to know that it's not. This is not the first time the conversation has been had, though. Um, I believe Queen Mother Moore. Uh, mm -hmm. Hopefully, hopefully I didn't mispronounce her name. I think yep. it's Queen Mother Moore. Um, there yep. are people who, as soon as enslavement ended, were advocating for reparations. Um, I mean, shoot, in Tulsa, they've been fighting for a while. The DOJ was actively investigating that. So hopefully, that can be resolved before Biden leaves. Um, I, I I think that it just takes bold people. You know, I think um, Congressman. Uh man, I'm 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 getting I'm, the names are leaving me, but she uh, the sister that was a congressman, uh, congresswoman in Texas. Uh, I think it was uh, Representative Sheila, uh, Sheila Jackson. Sheila Jackson. Sheila Jackson. Yep. She was yep. a big proponent of it, but again, like she can't be the only main proponent, right? And that was right. just for the study. So I think it takes boldness. Like it, we ain't too far from it because my idea as a student of history is, if we being real. You know, like let's say a uh, uh, woman, as in white white women, got the right to vote. In 1919, the first state that allowed it was Wyoming, I believe, in 1860, 1870, something. Wow. That's a 50-year gap, right? So wow. let's let's say California, which is making it further than any other state on this topic, um, has some issues with the governor signing some things and the support. And I think he probably strung some folks along. Then they also say the budget was, I don't know, it was a lot of misunderstandings right there, right? But if they pass something, if we look at it from that standpoint it could take 50 plus years for that to be a national thing because what we're also missing is we got to have congressional support we got to have congressmen and women who feel like if they bring it up they ain't gonna lose a job and their number one uh, job is to keep their job and as a representative you only get two years really one and a half maybe one because you spend in the next year 
campaigning, right? right. <laughs> so I think a lot of folks even feel like, bro, I want to do it, but if I mention it, the white people that's voted for me probably ain't going. So, and here's what I here's what I'll say, man. And this is why I so this is the the, the thing that I grapple with, right? Democrats should do a lot better, but I also understand that if they had been, if she had been elected, that was our best chance. Hmm. But I mean, I, there is, there's no chance. I don't, unless Trump just yeah. completely flips, bro. Cause he was <laughs> lying on her saying that she was like this unabashed supporter of reparations as a way to say that she's a bad presidential candidate. That was one of his talking points. Wow. She, I think she, she would have signed the study, I believe. But then again, how many more years after the study? Right. Um, I feel like the study should just be, we don't need to pass a law to do What is there to study, bro? I hate yeah, hearing that. Yeah, what it's, is there it's, to study? It's, it's, I do believe we need to get it right, but I don't right. think that it should take a law to start a study. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, right. that could literally be an executive order. Like really, right. are, and, and also with reparations, um, I think that with his election, it's going to set back any progress now this is their progress, right? Any that political lens, because now we don't have Congress, and this, and with HR forty, not one Republican supported. It was all Democratic wow. support. So then we ain't got the Supreme Court, and we probably ain't gonna have that bro for the rest of our life. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's a crazy thing to say, man. That's crazy, bro. Because if if it passed, we know somebody would sue the same way they sue for affirmative action, right? Wow, and we wouldn't have somebody that would before us we need to shift our approach and it needs to be a state level now in my opinion um yeah. like you know Ill they have a reparations commission in illinois you know because mm -hmm. california is doing it i think we got to do what we should have been doing i think we probably started too high by demanding something of the president because again they only gonna talk about it if there's a ground swelling and if grassroots are saying it. and that's why it became more of a public conversation but i, I bet you bro if there were 20 some states doing it, they would have talked about it because she brought up marijuana legalization, not because she probably cared, but because there are more and more states making it legal. They opening up dispensaries like Walgreens, yeah. corner stores now. So it's it's in the last 10 years, public perception of that has, ch has changed. So we got to buckle down and say, go to your state legislators. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like, especially in a Southern state, which again, it seemed like it would be hard to do, but that's where we going to have to start, unfortunately. And, it's another thing, bro. And again, on the communication side, um, I, I hate to even say this, man, but you know how woke was flipped to mean something mm -hmm. negative? Reparations yeah. is always going to come across as some welfare type policy to the masses. All right. We know it's not, but if we're going to demand reparations, it has, if it's, and that means it's going through a system. And that system also includes white people. We know we owe because even if you came here after enslavement, you benefited from what we was forced to do. So mm -hmm. you owe me right. for that. So what you talking right. about, right? But again, messaging, Republicans do a great job of making us believe something is bad that's actually good. We've been saying woke. Now you said, hey, oh, you are you one of them them woke libs or you are one of them snow. Bro, what you talking about? Genius Jedi trick, man. man. It was genius. Bruh. So when you yeah, say reparations, James. not oh, you yeah. over here trying to take my tax money. Okay. Restorative investments in my community. <laughs> I mean, like mm. re re restitution for communities that have been impacted by, you know what I'm saying? Like, so yes. we, we, I don't want us to get so hung up on the word. Um, and I also don't want us to forget that in politics, it's a, it's a partnership. So sometimes we're going to have to go with the person who unfortunately is next to being the worst, but not the worst, so that we can force their hand. A lot of times it's about the ability to negotiate and the capacity to negotiate. And again, the image in my head, bro, is every time LBJ was signing a document, Dr. King was right over his shoulder. And then I tell people it was almost like he was saying, let me just make sure you're doing what's right. Because right. we know that white man wouldn't do it without King forcing him to. He ain't want mm -hmm. Fannie Lou Hamer to talk. Wow. We, we know we know um Frederick Douglass one going I'm sorry not Frederick Douglass we know Lincoln one going to do what he did if it weren't for Frederick Douglass and every other black activist during that time and black folks running away he didn't start he, like the Civil War was to maintain the Union he wanted them to be together to continue yeah. to enslave us 
And then when he signed the document of emancipation, it was contingent upon us fighting and us winning. He ain't do that. Kudos to him for being in that position, but that's a partnership and we held most of the weight. So Lincoln ain't, he's far from perfect, but imagine how that would have been though if we had Andrew Johnson. <laughs> who mm. became the president right after and rolled back every single thing. Because yeah. if, if we get so hung up on the fact that, yeah, Lincoln was also, he, he was on some foul, he was trying to colonize us, all types of stuff. But he also possessed the ability to uh, to negotiate and be more willing to negotiate than other folks. And I think that's something that we got to remember. Uh, we got to work with, we got to have people in office we can work with and reparations or whatever it's going to be called is going to have to start locally because on a federal level, we cooked. Mm. Unless, <laughs> unless, <laughs> unless Trump like, you know what, y'all was messed up. I bro, changed I'm, my mind. Bro, I'm talking, I'm woke, y'all. Like if, if Trump, <laughs> like, it's <laughs> his last term. You never know. You never know. <laughs> Real talk. Curtis, man, I enjoy this conversation thoroughly, brother. I just have a few more questions for you, but man, thank you for your time. Yep. Yep. Last night, I'm watching all the political talk shows. I'm watching Fox News, CNN, and something told me, let me check in on Roland Martin Unfiltered. And Roland, I have my own critiques of him, but I just wanted to hear that perspective from our older Black community, right? Mm -hmm. Our yeah. Black elite somewhat. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, I'm hearing Roland and his colleagues as well finally admit, hey, guys, we might not really have a black and brown coalition like how we thought we did <laughs> and hispanics might be white adjacent which is something that i've been saying for a long time i've had friends whose parents are hispanic and they are the biggest trump supporters and they could be immigrants and they're like we don't want immigration <laughs> but Ernest, do you believe in your heart of hearts that there is no black and brown coalition because from everything that i've seen personally i say no but how do you feel about it yeah, so that's a great question, man. Um, I'm, I'm I was uh I was laughing too because I was looking at this post from somebody on Threads, and this lady said, um, and I quote, "I'm fresh out of advocacy for anyone who ain't black. Figure it out yourself." Close quote. Um, I think that sums up how we all feeling, man. So I'll start by saying, I've seen, I've seen a lot of it. I've seen it work before. Um, I I think that black and brown um unity is is probably the wrong phrasing though because for one historically you know they weren't referred to as brown that was something you know right. but that's a whole other conversation but i think we need to look at it more so as an ideological convergence i mm -hmm. think we perceive that people who have also dealt with racism like us but not the same level of course just more so in terms of how they're viewed not the historical experience would naturally join with us and some have right i can't put a certain number on that in the community i live and where i taught i've seen it but i've also like you said I've, I've i've felt and seen the racism i've had students tell me that they younger siblings had racist thoughts about black people and how horrible they felt you know what i'm saying um i've had students tell me about how their fathers were and how they view black folks and i felt the vibe when I've had parent teacher conferences and, mm. and understanding that y'all, you definitely weren't expecting to see a black man teaching yeah. your child. Right. <laughs> I, I think our, and I've seen it in Chicago, man, like where I've seen organizations come together. But again, the key point that I'm saying is ideological. I think that we're, we're going through a shift now of we can no longer let the racial identity be the only thing that bonds us. We know the experiences that I'm going to have with somebody that might be, might be black, but we know, bro, like you said, a Clarence Thomas or the dude who ran, the dude who called himself a, a black uh, N-A-Z-I, because I don't want this to be flagged for saying Oh, that. yeah, man. Yeah. He was wilding. Right. Yeah, I know you're right. talking about <laughs> We, we yeah. look the same, but there is no ideological unity right there at all. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I think that we have to be more intentional about, okay, diversity, yeah, but again, the equity, the inclusion, right? So I always tell people, shoot, uh, plantations weren't segregated. That was diverse, right? You know what I'm saying? So like, I'm not, I'm, I'm more so concerned with what's what's in your heart of hearts, what's in your mind. Um, I don't think we have the time to be concerned with issues that primarily impact the Hispanic population, but because we got so much going on ourselves, 
I wish everybody well in their plight. You know what I'm saying? But I have to worry about what's going on in my immediate community right now. Um, I cannot also discount those who are uh, Afro-Latinos. I follow a lot of folks who are Afro-Latino who advocate and stick up and who look, you couldn't probably couldn't even tell with right. Dominican or Puerto Rican. And they talk about what they deal with within that community. So I don't want to discount that. I, I think kind of like what even Roland said, like we should have never been prioritizing that concern though. You know, like even with, uh, I think you talked about how how Biden made that remark before. We, sh we should have never been pushing our needs to the forefront for them of course their populations are increasing and everything but i'm not about to starve <laughs> you know what i'm saying to put myself out there so just to kind of wrap it up man like i, I again I, I wish everybody well and, and, and with them and what they what they're doing and what they think is best but it's you know as far as me and my house as they say <laughs> you know me and my family mm -hmm. um yeah. i gotta worry about my kids first i gotta worry about my community first i gotta be more concerned about people who have the same ideology as me as opposed to people who uh think that we have a bond just because we look the same or because mm -hmm. trump may have attacked us verse i'm sorry right. uh both the same um mm -hmm. with with vile language because we thought we had an ally with that because he made his campaign announcement on the back of being racist towards them. We was yeah. like, oh, bet, like, not everybody can see it. And we probably went harder against him because of that hmm. than they did. <laughs> see, what we have started to probably realize and probably should have already understood, bro, is racism is probably only a deal breaker to black people. Ooh. That's a bar, Ernest. Wow. White people wow. who voted for Trump will probably say, yeah, he racist. And that don't impact me. <laughs> They're, I mean, like being real, they they were talking to Puerto Ricans after their remark was made at, at Madison Square Garden. It was like, okay, I'm over here. Like you said, some folks will get citizenship and be like, that ain't my problem now. So that's our deal breaker. And I think we, when whenever we bond with another group, we have to remember that that's our deal breaker. It might not be the same for them. And if we do form bonds, let's be real about what it's for because Fred Hampton did it, but they was on some class stuff. When they were talking about race stuff, that was probably a completely different scope of things, right? We're going on some class struggle stuff with y'all. But when it comes to this black stuff, I don't need your input. I, I don't... promise it is different. Exactly. So, yeah, yeah man, I, I think like we got we to gotta stop like, I ain't trying to be friends with everybody, man. My my, my mm -hmm. philosophy truly is I'm going to do the work. If you see me doing the work and you want to help here, I'm going to give you a shovel too. I'm going to give you this too. But I'm, I can't stop what I'm doing because I think it's going to look good politically just to help you out too. It has to really make sense for what's going on for us, in my opinion. Come on, brother. Very last question too for you, Ernest. But the great Dr. Clark once again told us Black Americans that we have no friends, man. So Yeah, yeah. That's to... okay unfortunate uh unfortunate reality that we that we keep realizing and we got to listen <laughs> i mean the elders are elders for they said what they said for a reason and that's some true bro and at some point we all see like you know how they, when you were younger you know your parents saying oh and you get older and it started to make sense when you get older. <laughs> like dang man my mom was right and you realize it at the same time that she probably told you that when she was at that point in life. At the same age. <laughs> Come on, brother. Man, Ernest, again, Hello. you killed this conversation. I can't wait to post this up tonight. Very last question for you. Dr. King, who you alluded to earlier, mm -hmm. he had this same question in a speech that people don't really talk about too much. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to propose the same question towards you. Where do we go from here? Where do we go from here, Ernest? I think mm -hmm. that that is the most poignant question that everybody has in this moment, especially black America. And since everybody's been talking about black men throughout the past few months, where do we go from here as leaders in our communities, in our households, mm. everywhere as black men mm. post Trump winning this 2024 election? Yeah. I think, uh, so again, I want people to be sure they understand this is being recorded a day after the election. Yeah. So, you know, this is fresh. Um, I think we have to uh, firstly, reevaluate our concept of manhood and masculinity um mm. we got to make sure that we understand that masculinity is not toxic but we also mm. have to make sure that we have a, a productive form of masculinity that we're expressing and not having it based upon what we were taught 
through white supremacist lens. I think that's the first thing, because what is what is being a father it can mean something different for us culturally than it would mean for somebody who's of European descent and so on and so forth. We got to really construct, deconstruct that and break that down and see what that means. Um, I think for me, one of my passions has been in terms of politically, when I ran for office in my community, um, I realized that we ain't, we ain't come out for local elections. It's, it was a 10% voter turnout where I live. Um, and that's not even disaggregated for racial background. So it may have been less than for us, maybe five, 6%. I think, and I hope that we use this as an opportunity not to continue to look outside of ourselves for the answer, but to look where we are. And what I mean that uh, literally and figuratively, um, we got to do the work ourselves. If we look at this as an opportunity to point fingers and blame folks, especially those who look like us, we're doing it wrong. Because some of our some of our organizations and some of our uh, so-called advocacy groups and people who are saying they're doing the work um, can have the great a great idea, but it can be delivered in a harmful manner because we're trying to hurt people or we're trying to demean people or we're trying to point the finger and say it's this person's fault. No, the problem is why we here. That's the problem. The problem is so-called white supremacy and its implementation and its belief. So we got to break away from that as much as possible and say that if we truly want to. If we wanted to like really run the White House, then we got to run the local schoolhouse. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And again, and think about if we even want that White House goal to be a goal. The goal should be let's put people in position where we actually live. And then in terms of folks that's going to have those federal positions or maybe the, the, uh, the president, we just need to be in position enough to wield power and influence. I don't care about being a person that signed it. But again, like our brother, Dr. King. So if we got 60, 70 percent of people voting for a president, but then only 10 percent voting for the thing that impacts us right now, that's a problem. That's really an American problem. But again, it's going to impact us the most. So my challenge to everybody now is to say, well, do you know who your city council or alderman is? Do you know who your mayor is? Do you know who your school board members are? Do you know what? If you have a township, do you know what that does and what they do? Do you know who's over your county and what they do? Do you know your state rep, the state senator? Do you know your governor, right? The challenge is not to have these things memorized, but to have a place you can go to find them and also know when you have a complaint or issue, who to go to for. Be on a first name basis with them. And if that's difficult for you to do, form a small group of people in your community and rotate this week, you contact this person. This week, I will. This week, you go to that meeting. The squeaky wheel gets like, what do they say? The squeaky wheel gets the oil, right? Yeah. When, when you constantly go to these meetings and they see you, and if you want to take the step to donate to them, they're going to listen. Because if you are, if you're going to a meeting with five people in a local election, that honestly can make a difference. I know people that lost elections by like five votes in the city council. Wow. You know what I'm saying? You go into a city council meeting with five, 10 people, and then you taking those clips, posting them online, and you're building people around it. That's how you begin to make change. And, and whereas I do, I'm very critical of what's done on a federal level with politicians, I strongly encourage all of us to try our best to get involved locally because the only way that's going to change on a federal level is if we change on a local level. Um, and it's the same thing. We only can change the world if we change ourselves. It sounds very, very simple. It sounds corny, but it's true. The reason why white America has not changed <laughs> is because they have no reason to want to change. They don't understand that they're drowning too. That's their problem. I can't worry about that right now because if they ain't got it now, they ain't going to never get it. But again, as far as me and my house, we got to figure this out right now. And it starts in the household and it starts in the community. Mm. Biblical too, man. Uh, Book of Joshua, I think one nine as far as being my house. So, oh yeah, that was intentional. Point. That was intentional. Yeah, yeah. Being my house. <laughs> hey, yeah. I'm with you, Ernest. Yeah, I'm with yeah. you, brother, man. Thank you so much again for your time the day after the election. This conversation it will be posted tonight. So we're already gonna have this up, all the clips shared. But where can everybody follow you? Keep up with your page where you're giving great work, speaking engagements, the whole nine. Yeah. So y'all could uh find me at earnestcram.com. That's E-R-N-E-S-T-C-R-I-M dot com. My uh social media handles are at M R Cram3. That's one M. A lot of people get that mixed up. It's C-R-I-M, one M. Um 
Also, too, yeah, same thing with speaking engagements. Hit me up at Ernest Cram. Send me an email at info at ErnestCram.com. And also, too, man, I will, uh, I'm going to have to connect, bro, because I'm coming to Atlanta next month, man. Oh, um, yeah. My hey, let's do it. Yeah, let me, uh, bro, I'm trying to, I'm done deal. doing this on the fly right here. So I'm I'm doing a, an event with the, oh, man, the Connect, I believe is what it's called. Okay. The, the, the Connect Cooperative. So for I'm anybody, yeah, for anybody that is um in the Atlanta area, the Connect Cooperative on Saturday, December 14th, I'll be there. I believe Perfect. the event starts at 10 o'clock. So yeah, hit me up, y'all. Let's get this work done. Yes, sir. And Ernest, if you're free, if time, if, you know, if it permits any, any way, any how, man, you are more than welcome bro, to pull up, chop it up and build, man, because yes, you were doing God's work. You were doing the ancestors work. You're doing what you're doing. I salute you, brother. Thank you Thank so you. much again for such a powerful and needed conversation. When you pull up to Atlanta, I'm there at that event. And, you know, hopefully as well, you can pull up to the studio. We can build. But thank you, brother. Keep doing great work. We're proud of you. The Emmys, don't even worry about them. I yeah. will say something unprofessional, but <laughs> you, you are already stamped, brother. And that's all that matters. As long as you got the people with you, you don't need their awards. We don't need their validation, their credits. You already got all the credits that you need, man. So I salute Thank you, bro. I'm going to stay in touch. And it's perfect timing. Next month, yeah. I'll see you, brother. So Appreciate be safe you, until then and keep up all the great work. Peace, brother. Peace, brother.